I'll be helping walk us through the discussion and we'll be uh, providing part of the presentation. I also have with me here Richard Jock, who is our, our COO. I believe most of you have heard on the line uh, Davis McKenzie, our, our Director of Communications. Uh, in the room here with me at, at Alberni, I also have Cindy Preston, who is our FNHA pharmacist as well as Catherine Coe, who is the uh, project manager for communications on our, our CCSP project. In terms of, of our agenda for today, uh, we have uh, five topics that we'd like to, or five pieces that we'd like to go through. First, we will uh, be looking for just a, a volunteer to help us with an opening prayer. Um, moving from there, uh, we will uh, ask Richard to speak to us uh, or with us uh, about really the context uh, for the changes that we see coming under under CPSP. And I know that he has some other things that I, I think he'd like to share as part of that, that discussion as well. Uh, that will lead into uh, some information from me specific to uh, the pharmacy transition that, that we'll be talking ab about here today. Also, spend a few minutes on what we call a scenario review. That those will be uh, three topics that we would like to highlight uh, where we can see uh, potential uh, challenges for community members, and we want to make sure we spend some some good time on that today. Uh, following that, I'll lead into uh, David, who will go over our communications plan at a high level, and we will conclude with. Uh, some, a Q&A period, uh, allowing people to jump in and ask us any questions or give us feedback on the specific scenarios that, that we had. So uh, it sounds like sort of we may be having a bit of audio problem yeah, here. Sorry. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, before I, I pass the call over, over to Richard, uh, I'd like to invite anyone. I wonder if we might have a volunteer who I uh, would be able to share some words about the, the work we'll do here today. Do we have anyone that would like to help us set off the discussion in a good way? Davis, would you perhaps like to say a few words? Sure, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to. Just getting a little bit of feedback uh, as well. If yeah. you can maybe um, mute, mute one of the uh, the systems there at Alberni. Uh, so, hello everybody. Um, my name is Davis McKenzie. My um, traditional name is Ajay Masoa, uh, which means making the change. And I'm from Guam and First Nation, and I'm joining you from Cree territory here up in Grand Prairie today. And just wanted to offer a, a brief prayer before we. Uh, get started um, and really acknowledge uh, the northern communities that have joined the call uh, to gather this information and take it home uh, about a, a few very important topics. Um, so I'd just like to offer a few words. Uh, basically just thanking the Creator for this beautiful day and for our togetherness on this call, uh, for us to work together with one heart, one mind uh, in creating a better future for our children, our relatives, uh, and all those generations. Uh, so with that, Darren, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much for, for that, David. Uh, I'll actually pass the, the call along to Richard Jock, who will uh, help us provide some context and, and background for this discussion. Thank you, and uh, what I'd like to uh, say uh, at the outset is that uh, we uh, are using this uh, technology and this method uh, really to make sure that the North uh, has access to the same uh, kind of information that uh, every other region has, and um, I acknowledge that there are uh, uh, efforts underway to um, to convene a meeting in the future, but uh, we felt that uh, really timeliness is, is, is the essence uh, with this, uh, this uh, set of very important uh, interests. Um, what I'd like to do is set, 
some of the context for the work we're doing uh, very briefly uh, because I do think it's uh, overall uh, part of the work that we're doing uh, and part of the work that we're doing uh, to follow up uh, with health directors uh, and with uh, health leaders across the province. And in particular, uh, we had efforts at the Quality Forum where we talked about um, uh, the kinds of work that lay before us uh, and uh, really are engaging health directors and health workers in terms of that work. So this is really a continuation of that and really uh, part of our ongoing efforts to, to really function in a way that reflects uh, partnership and uh, appropriate um, uh, discussion as we uh, go for and seek the transformation that, uh, that really we've been tasked with uh, collectively. So in terms of our priorities as an overall organization, part of that focus is on a quality agenda and really looking at how do we improve services on a continuous basis and really this is part of our, our context and our background and I would say is really the basis for the kinds of uh, efforts and change that we're looking at with this uh, pharmacy project as well. Um, in keeping with this, uh, looking at how cultural safety and, and humility is part of the system, not only for the services that we operate, but also entrenching these into the uh, health authorities and to the health system uh, across the province and there's much uh, work that's being done uh, to secure this and to put this in place in a real way. Part of that also is how do we make sure that we have the uh, ability to um, raise um, uh, complaints, raise issues to us so that we can look at how how we can address those both within the FNHA, but also importantly within our partners and within the hospitals and other systems operated by our partners. Furthermore, uh, this year we will be having a focus on priorities for those living away from home. Uh, we will have specific focus and separate resources to deal with some of the issues related to urban health. Um, of course, there's uh, been much uh, work and discussion lately on the issue around opiates, and this will be also an important part of how uh, this, uh, uh, the health needs of those in, this, in the urban areas are dealt with uh, going forward. Ultimately, a lot of what we're doing, and I think, you know, reflecting on the last couple of days with the 150-year anniversary, of Confederation, uh, you have heard the voice of First Nations, First Nations communities calling for reconciliation with the, with the broader population, with our surrounding communities, with surrounding citizens. And part of our uh, ability to address our issues really is related to a reconciliation agenda. And I think this starts and has started with residential schools, but it resonates really throughout much of our efforts. Uh, primary care and mental health are really uh, key areas that we are focusing on, and I'll give you just a snapshot of that. And as I mentioned, uh, starting the process of transformation really is starting with the, uh, with having pharmacy move off the Health Canada system. As long as we're on that system, we really won't be able to make any changes. The process and everything uh, is done through a buyback, which means that we can make no changes to that system. So first effort is really moving off uh, pharmacy, and I'll talk a little bit more about other uh, work that's coming as well. The other aspect I want to uh, mention very briefly, uh, next slide, is uh, that capital. Uh, at this point, uh, we We've looked at what is the uh, sort of anticipated demand for buildings and what's available. Uh, and what we've identified is that there's really huge demand for capital. One of the things that's been very um, uh, important over the last two years is that we have 
secured an additional $20 million for through the federal investments in social infrastructure, and we will fully extend that over the, the last year and this year. Uh, and I, we are anticipating that we'll get additional dollars to do this. Uh, part of what uh, we are also doing is uh, investing in areas that previously Health Canada uh, never invested. Uh, and two of those uh, examples are in terms of uh, renovation support and future building for NADAP uh, treatment programs. Uh, this has really been off the table for at least 15 years and we're investing in these areas. And one of our first examples will be the funding of the Tanaha 7 um, nation treatment program uh, in the in the Tanaha and uh, um, uh, in the Tanaha area. The other uh, aspect is we'll be moving to increasing transparency, and we'll be posting our five-year plan plus uh, the communities within our five-year plan, <clears throat> and we'll have a, a capital uh, committee to make decisions so that it's. It's more transparent and more inclusive and uh, has broader decision making. And there are future transformation opportunities that we're seeking to partner with communities. And these are developing and unfolding uh, over the next uh, days and months. But we really do need to transform our capital program if we're to really have a, a change in, in how uh, we're able to deliver and how we're able to support with appropriate facilities, the health services that are needed uh, at the health service level. I just want to comment very briefly because this is really uh, an important area of development is that Jordan's principle is something that's uh, um, uh, very um, important and it's uh, intended to make sure that no, uh, no child is denied essential services. And I just want to highlight that uh, because, uh, uh, for example, U.S. service delivery people are key in terms of identifying situations where children are being denied services and that we do have uh, resources to address those concerns. We are also providing uh, our Jordan's principal coordinator started today and we're having coordinators in each of the regions that will also be there to support conference planning, case conferencing, uh, and also how to um, how to make sure that these situations are dealt with uh, very quickly. We use the health benefits uh, infrastructure to, uh, to pay for most of these. Uh, and uh, there's um, also uh, uh, on our website, uh, we have a uh, we have a contact area, and it's www.fnha.ca slash Jordan's Principle, all one word. So um, again, this is really an important um, aspect, and we want to make sure that everybody has some very brief exposure to this. Part of our um, efforts is looking at uh, the um, approach, which we're calling Primary Health Care Plus Plus, and really, this is how do we look at uh, new access to primary care services? Uh, how do we look at incorporating traditional medicine as a distinct part of our operation? And how do we integrate and coordinate with the provincial services that surround us? So um, um, I just want to say that part of what's happening is this uh, model is something we're looking at rolling out more thoroughly across the province uh, and across the region. But I do want to say that uh, non-insured health benefits is definitely part of an overall health approach, and we want to make sure that it supports those health interests going forward. A further aspect of that is, is related to what we're calling end-to-end -end integration. And this really is how do we support uh, projects to really fully operationalize these primary care interests. And uh, what we're uh, doing at this point 
is making sure that all of the enablers, such as eHealth, uh, electronic medical records, and the, some of the data systems like Panorama are all built into and accounted for. And then um, uh, what our plan is to build this out to all of the projects um, with the learnings determined uh, from our first set of, um, of uh, integration projects. So we'll be starting on one project for each region, looking at how we make this part of an overall systems approach and then uh, we'll be uh, moving forward. And this really has to be part of our overall sustainable approach to health services uh, moving forward. Uh, the telehealth piece, of course, is, uh, is an important part of that. Um, I just want to report that we are also working with our health director partners and in the other regions we actually had engaged workshops where we're looking at how do we redesign our reporting requirements uh, and how do we do this in a way that uh, we're, uh, we're really making sure the information is useful at every level. So essentially designing it so that it's useful for health directors to report to their communities, to their governance, to their chief and council or board, uh, then useful as a roll up at the regional level and at the national level. Part of what we found in looking at reporting is the old community-based reporting template that nobody was reading it. Uh, and partially it was because that the information in that template really was not analyzable uh, nor collatable. I don't know if those are words. But, <laughs> but I think that uh, as a result, what we've determined is that we're not requiring that for this year. Uh, but we do want to look at what would be a substantial and important way to replace it. Uh, and further, looking at how um, uh, communities uh, will invest their surplus reinvestment is an important part of making sure that as we go forward that, um, that we're addressing the priorities uh, of mental health and wellness and substance abuse of uh, primary care uh, and uh, and the needs that uh, are being really identified going forward. So I just have a couple of slides here because there have been comments made uh, in past uh, regional caucuses and I think it's important to uh, show the difference um, between um, what escalator was received um, uh, by Health Canada, everybody else in Health Canada, and what's been received by community-based programs since FNHA uh, took over. So just showing the difference, uh, in 2014, uh, the federal government uh, gave 2%, FNHA gave 5.5. Uh, uh, this was also a permanent allocation. In uh, 2015, uh, federal government gave 2% and we again gave 5.5%. Uh, 2016, the federal government gave 3%, but only on certain programs and some of that was not permanent. Uh, again, we gave uh, 2000, um, uh, in 2016, we gave 5.5%. So uh, this year, uh, what has happened is um, Health Canada is anticipated is going for 2.5%. And what we are doing, uh, and you'll get a letter to this effect, so you heard it here first, you will get 5.5%. Uh, but of that, 2.5% of that will be permanent, uh, and the uh, additional 3% will be one time. And that's really um, uh, looking at, uh, uh, because next year we don't know what the escalator is, and we're looking at ways to make sure that we're addressing uh, the seven directives. So, uh, so that's what uh, our allocation will look like. But I think it's important to show that uh, really we have put significantly more uh, resources 
uh, in than would have been there with Health Canada. And this is an abbreviated presentation. I actually show the difference in dollar value uh, when you look at uh, it on a on an overall basis. So um, um, one of the reasons why we're reserving that three percent uh, and making that um, one time is that if you look at uh, the slides where it shows community A, and you have a, a, a significant size uh, community of five million dollars, you see that at the end of three years the increase is eight hundred seventy-one thousand. On uh, community B, which is a smaller community. Um, you can see that that three-year increase would be only 34000 So essentially what this does is it really creates inequities so that the larger projects accumulate more and more and have more means to address uh, systems, barriers, new programming, et cetera, whereas smaller communities do not. And we want to make sure that we're addressing these in a way that, that makes sense. And as we say, leaves no community behind. And in the past, uh, part of what we heard, especially in the north, that we need to address the nursing disparities, uh, that we deal with capital needs, and that we address O&M and uh, costs for such things as telehealth, which currently are not within the base. <clears throat> so then getting on to the immediate subject, uh, the idea is move ahead with Pharmacare that we're targeting October 1st. And this has a couple of immediate uh, benefits. As you know, the non-insured program under Health Canada has a payer of last resort. In this case, uh, moving with, ahead with Pharmacare will make this the payer of first resort. So it eliminates that, uh, that issue, which has been an irritant raised by First Nations across the province and across the country. It'll also improve uh, Special Authority Act process, um, and it, um, you know, it, it's a service that's available at every pharmacy in BC and will have much better access and understanding, so part of this will be uh, really improve that access. The goal is really to work towards seamless transition, but uh, it's, it's really important to state that there are challenges ahead, and uh, partially what's happening is we're working to address those challenges before the October date, but we want to be upfront and talk about some of those and to uh, look at uh, what are some of the suggestions for addressing some of these challenges. So some of the challenges, just very briefly, are that uh, if someone goes out of the province, uh, this Pharmacare program, the BC-based program, and thus uh, we would have to look at what would be the reimbursement process. Over-the-counter drugs typically are not covered by Pharmacare. So again, looking at what would be our mechanism for dealing with this is something that we are really uh, working on. Uh, and moving forward with uh, over the next period of time. But uh, part of that is we want to have a discussion of that and, uh, and also we commit to further communication over the next month as we address these challenges or as more information becomes available. The other piece of this, of course, is that this is really the first benefit. And it's really sort of the the keystone benefit in terms of moving off the federal system. But we recognize that it's really important to move off very quickly in terms of dental benefits. That really dental uh, and uh, medical supplies and equipment and eyeglasses are areas that have been raised continuously really as a, as a problem. Uh, and uh, I would say that dental in particular has been a process of speed bumps and slowdowns really as cost containment measures. So we want to move to a different system uh, moving forward. So, um, so really I just want to say that uh, you know, this has really been a, a, a tremendous effort on the part of our team. Uh, we're doing our best to resolve issues and also 
to make sure that we communicate very clearly on this uh, as we go forward. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands our commitment to this and to uh, addressing issues. So uh, Darren. Um, Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Um, for those following along on the phone, but maybe not on the webinar, uh, I'm moving on to slide 12, which is uh, listed as key point uh, project status. Again, as, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, my name is Darren McKnight. I'm, I'm uh, the business lead on our, our CPSD project. And this is something that our, our team in Health Benefits has been immersed in for, for quite some time. So we're, we're actually really excited to be able to to now be out there and, and talking about, about the work, sharing information on the, the progress that we've been making and also uh, taking the opportunity to, to gain your, your feedback uh, through the Q&A period that we'll have uh, and as well in, in any follow-up correspondence. Uh, so where are we at now? As, as Richard mentioned, um, drugs will be the, the first benefit to transition off of the, the Health Canada platform. Uh, we've selected Pharmacare as our provider, and, and Richard mentioned we're working towards a, an October 1 implementation date. Uh, a, a real significant amount of work has, has gone into to this, to getting us to this point. And one key uh, milestone that I would like to mention is the development uh, of, a, of a regulation change which will allow FNHA clients uh, to access uh, Pharmacare programs. This is now in place, and we'll, we are then well positioned for our October 1 uh, transition. Uh, we've also been very, working very closely with, with the province on uh, developing uh, a transition plan. And, and I always like to mention that, that this has been a very positive working relationship with the Ministry of Health and, and with Pharmacare. They've been actually a fabulous partner to begin uh, working with us. Uh, it, it's quite refreshing in terms of these challenges that, that Richard has mentioned that we come across each time we we come up to a new hurdle. It, it really is as simple as, you know, a partner that is saying to us, how can we help and, and let's work on this, this together. So uh, I, I think we're moving forward in a, a very good uh, good direction and, and frankly a, a historic direction. Uh, at, we are the first uh, group uh, of First Nations in Canada to integrate with a provincial drug plan. We are also working to actively address items that are not part of the Pharmacare formulary. Richard mentioned OTCs. Um, there, these are these challenges that I'll, I'll get into a little bit more on the next slide. But we, uh, while we've been working on the, the transition to Pharmacare, we are also proactively working at, at addressing uh, the items that, that fall out of that. The, there's really a, a sort of a short-term and a long-term plan there. Um, over the short run, we expect to maintain coverage uh, for a number of these items through the NIHB program. Uh, and over the long run, as Richard alluded to, we'll be looking for a third-party provider to assist us in, in maintaining uh, comprehensive coverage for those items that are, are not covered through the Pharmacare program. I really see all this work as, as really the, the first step. Um, with the concurrent work on an RFP, uh, looking at dental vision and MSNE, what we're doing is, is we're building partnerships, we're first with Pharmacare and then a third party provider, which is going to help us uh, build that platform that we need in order to transform services in the future, which is the, the lens we really want to put on it as we try and work to better meet the needs of, of First Nations Health Authority clients. I'll move now to slide 13, uh, benefits and challenges. Uh, first talk about the benefits and then uh, I'll get into the, the challenges in a little bit of detail here and then a, a few scenarios over the, the coming slides. In, in terms of benefits, when we set out to do this work, we, we looked to try and increase access to benefits and services and also to close the gap between how services are accessed for First Nations and non-First Nations people in BC. With our partnership uh, with Pharmacare, uh, we're really gaining alignment with provincial standards and practices. Uh, we will have access to the same formulary as is available uh, to other British Columbians. 
We also set out to reduce health care provider confusion between the, the federal and provincial services. Uh, we, we really often hear that providers don't necessarily understand the NIHB process. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of them not working uh, within that system often enough to be efficient, and that, that can cause problems for our clients either in the physician's office or at the pharmacy counter. Um, moving forward, uh, moving to the largest provincial or the largest uh, drug program in BC, uh, BC pharmacists, physicians, and other prescribers uh, are more familiar with the pharmacare processes. And one clear example of where we should see some efficiency is in special authority uh, processes, which uh, are now physician-driven under pharmacare, and we should expect to see uh, some improved client service based on, on that change. As well, we, we've also looked to enhance coordination across jurisdictions and, and remove policy barriers. And we should see improvements uh, in two areas that we can point to. Uh, one is improved access to uh, palliative care medications and supplies. Uh, and another is in, in training uh, for blood glucose test strip monitoring. So this, this regulation change and this access to uh, a new plan under Pharmacare, as well as the other uh, plans and services that are available under the, the Pharmacare umbrella opens a number of doors for our, our clients that, that uh, we feel should be a, really a benefit uh, for, for everyone. As Richard mentioned, though, uh, there, are, there are challenges ahead. We, we do want to be clear uh, on that. Um, some of them are, are somewhat high level. Uh, this, this move from NIHB to Pharmacare, it's just something that, that hasn't been done before, and it does require uh, a lot of collaboration and implementation between ourselves at FNHA, uh, between our partners at Pharmacare, and, and of course our, our partners at NIHB as well. From a communications perspective, uh, in the coming slides, David will, will talk a little bit more about that, but this is the first time that we've really tried to reach out to our entire client base. Uh, people from urban to rural that are spread across the province, uh, and that uh, is, is, as we found, to be uh, somewhat easier said than done. The last three challenges, uh, I, I will get into them over the scenarios in the next few slides. Richard mentioned them as well. Out of province claims, the need to transition uh, some people uh, between drugs from formulary to formulary, and then over-the-counter drugs as well. I'll, I'll speak to those a little bit more over the, the coming few slides. Uh, Sorry, if we could move along two slides. I'll move to the slide titled uh, Scenario 1, which, which is change in therapy. We, we have three scenarios here. Um, and it, these are issues that, that we'd really like to obtain some feedback from you. Uh, hopefully within the Q&A at the end of this call, uh, but there's also the online chat feature available. Uh, if you'd like to type in any, any questions or comments, uh, we'd certainly appreciate that. And as well, on, on the final slide of this presentation, we'll put some contact information that if you'd like to send in any questions to us, uh, it would be uh, certainly much appreciated. I, uh, these are, are scenarios that we obviously prefer to talk through in a bit of detail with people, but this uh, format of a webinar can make it a little bit challenging to have a, a detailed conversation. So we'll do our best going through the scenarios. The first one, uh, scenario one, a, a change in therapy. Um, there are a small number of drugs that are available through NIHB uh, that may not be available through Pharmacare. Um, we have one example which we'll highlight here which impacts approximately 500 people. Uh, we've chosen it because it's the largest example. Uh, there are, are smaller uh, examples which impact just a handful of people. Uh, but we want to highlight uh, that some people will be asked to change medication uh, in most cases, though, uh, drugs will have an alternate drug available within the same class on the new formulary. So clients, what they'll need to do is talk to their physician regarding this, this change in, in medication, and it would be ideal if, if they could have that conversation prior to October 1. So uh, given that background information, uh, the scenario which we'd like you to consider just to help better understand the example uh, would be an, an elder 
who is taking Genuvia. Uh, as we mentioned, there's approximately 500 people in the province taking this medication uh, for diabetes. And to prepare for October 1, we would want to ask that client to speak with their physician about alternative therapies which are available in the, in the same class. So I'd just like you to hopefully think about that uh, scenario for uh, a moment. Uh, and certainly, if you have any thoughts, comments, questions, uh, either type them into the uh, chat function or start popping them into an email, uh, which will provide contact info, or um, certainly feel free to ask during the Q&A at, at the end of the, the session. So that's scenario one. Uh, we'll, we'll move to scenario two. Uh, Richard, I, I believe, mentioned this one as well. Moving from the NIHB program, which is a, a national or federal program, uh, we're moving into Pharmacare, which is a, a provincial one. Um, Pharmacare uh, does not have uh, relationships in place with uh, pharmacies that are outside the province of BC. So aside from a number, a small number of border pharmacies in the Yukon and, and Alberta, uh, if a client is traveling outside the province of, of BC, when they go to a uh, pharmacy counter, uh, they will not be able to access uh, pay direct drugs um, under the Pharmacare program. So clients may be required to pay out of pocket. Uh, what we would ask is that they uh, then submit receipts uh, for reimbursement, and uh, we're currently working on exactly what that policy and process looks like, and, and we'll be sharing information closer to the October 1st date. Uh, our recommendation to, to our clients, and you'll see this in some of our communications, uh, is to plan ahead. Uh, if you're planning to leave the province, uh, we would ask community members uh, to make sure they have enough medication for their trip. Uh, if they don't, uh, to visit their physician and, and talk about uh, how they might be able to obtain what, what they need uh, for their travel. And then certainly if you do need to purchase medication while you're outside of BC, to save your, your uh, receipts uh, for reimbursement. So that provides a bit of background, um, just in terms of how that may be applied in, in a scenario. Um, if we can go back to slide, scenario two there. So uh, how that may be applied in a scenario, uh, we have a, a community member, Mary, who's going to Calgary to care for her sick mother. Uh, she's planning to travel for three months. Uh, before leaving, she will need to fill her chronic medication at the pharmacy counter uh, within BC. If Mary chooses to stay longer uh, than three months, she can have her prescription filled in Calgary, but she may have to pay out of pocket and submit for reimbursement. So, so again, I, I, we provide that uh, as, as a bit of food for thought, per se, uh, for you to consider and submit any, any comments or, or questions to us. And then if you could move to the, the final scenario. This relates to over-the-counter medication. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we are expecting to continue coverage for over-the-counter medication through the NIHB program uh, after October 1st, uh, that that is our, our short-term plan, and that over the long run we intend to transition that coverage to a, a third-party provider. So uh, in the short run, NIHB or Ends Health Canada will support what, what we've called a, a non-duplicate formulary, which would include over-the-counter medications as, as well as a small number of prescription drugs, and that, that will be expected to continue past October 1st. Health Canada has been very clear with us uh, that that uh, technical change to the coverage for BC clients uh, is very complex, and they have shared uh, a concern or, or a risk that it could compromise their system and indicated to us uh, that if uh, it were to create a system challenge, that they may need to stop providing that, that coverage for our clients on, on short notice. Um, if there are any concerns that arise, if, if that were to occur, we would certainly want to ensure our clients have our, our health benefits support line and are, are able to reach out to FNHA to help work through that problem. Uh, so the scenario there, uh, one that um, 
is not expected to present itself, but, but could, and it's something that we wanted to put out there. Uh, we have Steve, uh, who is taking a seasonal allergy medication, an OTC covered by NIHB. Uh, he generally uh, presents his status card, and the, and the pharmacist processes the claim for Claritin. Um, what we're flagging is that if, for some reason, Health Canada is not able to provide that coverage, uh, and the system uh, cannot process that claim, then Steve may need to pay out of pocket. Uh, and again, that, that's a, just a scenario that we'd like you to, to consider. As I said, we, we expect coverage to continue through NIHB, but we've been warned of the potential eventuality uh, that, that coverage could be compromised over, over the short run. I think that, that gets through each of the scenarios that I wanted to go over. Um, I'd like to invite Davis into the call uh, again, and he'll speak to uh, messaging and, and our approach to communications with, with the project. Davis? Great. Thank you, Darren. And I just wanted to, to note for the group at Alberni, we've got a couple of uh, great questions popping up in the chat box, and so if we can just uh, start to uh, gather our thinking around that, I think it would be super helpful. Um, so if we could... Uh, just, just to reintroduce myself for the folks on the line, my name is Davis McKenzie and I'm the Communication Director with the FNHA. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes with you uh, walking through our communication plan and I, I think Lloyd, your question is a really good one around uh, physicians, will they be informed and aware of the changes uh, taking effect? So we, we'll, we'll cover uh, some of the ways that we're reaching out to physicians, pharmacists, uh, as well as clients in this portion of the presentation. So um, without uh, further ado, uh, we're hoping that uh, this communication preview uh, will support you uh, in your health service operations back home. Uh, so today we'll be reviewing key messages, communication channels, and time frames. Uh, as uh, discussed, we know this isn't going to be a perfectly uh, seamless uh, transition necessarily. But I do think one of the most important uh, key messages is that the strong majority or the high majority of clients uh, won't be impacted. Uh, so, so for most folks, you may not even notice changes happen in the background. Um, so, so I think that's an important message to keep in front of mind uh, as we move this work forward. Um, as as uh, we had uh, talked about earlier, I think one of the major changes is just around planning. Ahead. So uh, as covered in the scenario, uh, the second most important message is around planning ahead. Because PharmaCare is a BC program and cannot pay for those prescriptions filled out of province. So uh, these key messages are going to be coming to all health centers in a marketing uh, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, next, next slide. So, in in terms of uh, communication uh, channels, so we're targeting uh, both our clients, but also healthcare providers. So, so to your question, uh, Lloyd, uh, and by healthcare providers, primarily we're looking at uh, pharmacists, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, and uh, nursing audiences as well, of course, as uh, health directors uh, working in First Nation communities. So I, I think a, a key challenge is really reaching these healthcare providers, uh, notifying of the change, them of the changes, speaking their language, uh, and, and gaining their support in messaging the change to clients. So uh, like I think in our, in our work around this, uh, we uh, decided the, the root of um, uh, the, the best possible route for this work would be to partner with the existing physicians, uh, nursing, colleges, associations, uh, and government partners. Uh, so you'll see sort of on the, on the slide here around communication channels, we've got a list of uh, the, our provider partners uh, that we'll be working with. Each of these has really well-worn communication channels to meet, uh, to provide messaging to their members. So the BC Pharmacy Association, for instance, has a really, really great partner. Uh, uh, in helping us to do that reach out to pharmacists. Um, so uh, I, I guess a little bit around pharmacists, since they're such a key audience, is, um, we are going to be going out to the top five uh, cities uh, and where the largest number of our clients are engaging with pharmacies, and three of these are in the north. Uh, so that would be uh, Prince Rupert, Prince George, uh, and Hazleton. And we'll be workshopping uh, our communication product with uh, pharmacy staff. This will also include cultural safety and humility training. We just felt it was a really great opportunity if we're going out anyway to talk about these changes would be to uh, to further that interest. 
Um, the PharmaCare team at the BC Ministry of Health, as Darren has alluded, uh, have been really great partners, and they will be communicating directly to the providers, uh, both on our behalf, but also on their own behalf as creators of this new plan. And because PharmaCare um, actually pays their bills, this avenue carries a lot of weight. So I wouldn't want to underestimate uh, the, the power of that. So PharmaCare has been a good partner, and they will be reaching out directly through their own communication channels to all of those providers with key messages and also where to go in case they run into any issues um, implementing the change. Um, so when it, when it comes to actually reaching our uh, First Nation uh, clients, uh, as alluded to earlier, uh, we, for reaching uh, 141,000 clients, we're, we're rolling out a, a very traditional multi-prong uh, campaign. So uh, in your uh, role, you, basic information and FAQs will always be available on both the FNHA site, but also the PharmaCare site. Uh, we're going to be rolling out uh, radio ads, and these are scenario-based radio ads, and our major investment with those is actually also in the north. Uh, so we'll be doing a, a big ad box, um, as well as this that it reach North Island. So, so some really specific uh, targeted uh, radio ads. Our social media uh, is going to roll out both organic, uh, so free, and paid uh, social media campaign. Uh, we've created a very simple animated video that is, describes the change and also alerts clients, I think, to the most uh, important things that they need to think about, such as plan ahead, uh, change of medication. So we'll be rolling that out. I think uh, one of the better uh, parts of the plan, and we haven't done this before, so so I'm quite excited about it, is we will be delivering individual client letters, uh, and these will go uh, to all uh, households um, with, uh, with our clients, and to everyone who's over the age of 18 on our registry list. And this, this letter will be uh, directed to the individual. It will tell them about about the change. This letter will also be um, enclosed in a package that we're going to be mailing out to each and every health center and each and every one of our community engagement coordinators. So you'll all have a copy of this letter on hand. Just in case, I mean, addresses, they, they can it can be a tricky thing. We really want to get her into the hands of all clients. Uh, finally, we'll have uh, standard brochures, rat cards, and posters um, mailed out in a, in a marketing kit. So again, these will go to uh, friendship centers, all of our First Nation health centers, patient liaisons working in the hospital, our community engagement coordinators, nursing staff, uh, regional health authority, Aboriginal health team, uh, and other partners. So, so a big, a big effort on that. If we could just move to the next slide, I'll talk briefly about the timeline. So, uh, for those that are following along by phone, uh, this is a little bit of a fuzzy graphic. It's the CTSD uh, communication roadmap. Uh, please don't worry too much about trying to read it. We'll, we'll walk through these uh, key time frames. So like I think the most important way to think about the end of June sort of through July is that this is a, a month uh, for us getting ready. Uh, so the website uh, content for us goes live next week, uh, both for FNHA and pharmacy. Uh, the marketing kits, which I talked about a little bit earlier, including posters, brochures, video, client letters, uh, will be mailed out at the end of next week. So those are being assembled now. And what we've done is, based on the um, population that we have for each community, we've created sort of small, medium, and large-sized kits. Uh, so you'll, you will receive a kit that's big enough to serve uh, your population. It's a bit tailored. Uh, as well, the uh, first client letter will be sent. So that's sort of a, in a nutshell. Uh, how we start rolling out the campaign in July. August is really about moving the transition into the public sphere more broadly. And so this is where our, our more uh, media campaign commences. We will be issuing a joint news release and backgrounder with the ministry on August 1st. So, so that'll be our first sort of real foray into the public space. Uh, our organic social media starts um, as well as our video and at this point through August, we really are going to be listening closely to providers, clients, uh, and health directors and our staff uh, in order to update those FAQs. So, you know, really listening what aspects of our strategy are working, what questions remain out there uh, and need to be captured in an FAQ and, and shared. Uh, the, I think the best way to think about September is we start to try to get loud. So, 
Uh, September is, is about uh, paid social media campaigns to some target uh, markets. As you may know, Facebook and other platforms, uh, a lot of our people are, are there and there's uh, definite ways to uh, reach uh, folks with this information. So we're putting a lot of effort into our social media campaign and we've got a three-week three, three week, uh, rotation created with a new type of uh, message each day. So a lot of opportunity to capture people's attention. Uh, we'll also commence our radio ad uh, rotation in September, and we'll be sending out our second client letter. Uh, so as uh, uh, Richard covered and Darren, there, there are some uh, aspects uh, uh, that we're still uh, really firming up. So that client letter provides us a, a second opportunity to reach out and, and share any evolving information around the project. Uh, as well, uh, the end of September, all the pharmacists and physicians will be getting the go live notice from Health Canada and the Ministry of Health. Uh, Health Canada saying, uh, you know, the NIHP program will cease for these uh, residents, and the ministry um, noting, welcome to PharmaCare, um, and here's our process. And then, uh, as you see, if, for those that can see the graphics, October 1 is uh, launch day. And uh, really, post October 1, there, there are communication activities because for us, it's really about uh, client service uh, and supporting any bumps in the road, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide because uh, we're really looking to ensure that our uh, customer service line is adequately resourced and, and trained to take on uh, any of those issues. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so I, I think if, if there are, if there's any takeaway from my portion of the presentation that I really hope uh, that you will, will, will take home with you, uh, it's around this slide. Uh, so as, as Darren alluded to, uh, questions and challenges are expected. Um, we will ask uh, that you remember some clients over time will need to transition to comparable drugs on the formulary, uh, so that was discussed. Clients traveling out of province are encouraged to fill those prescriptions in advance. And we created a customer service safety net for those that don't have their issues addressed uh, in a timely way. So we're staffing up, we're training those folks. Uh, we will, uh, we're sending out about 100,000 items with our phone number on it, uh, which is the 1-855-550-5454 number. And that's our health benefit support rep line. And we really, really encourage you out in the field working. If any of your clients have any issues with this transit, please do call us. Uh, we're staffing up to be able to uh, to meet that need. Uh, so just just to close up, I'd I'd like to give you a quick preview of our marketing kit, which will be arriving at your door sort of over the next 20 days uh, or so, depending on your location. Um, and the marketing kit, the, the idea is that um, we were able to meet and discuss the project with the First Nations Directors Association uh, Board of Directors, and we received some, I think, some really helpful advice from them early on uh, that we needed to support you uh, to bring the conversation to the client. Um, so this evolved into the idea of a marketing kit uh, that would be helpful to facilitate the client conversations. You'll see a list in front of you on the slide that's entitled the marketing kit content. I won't go over those in detail. Um, I think many of them are very self-evident. Um, but what you will receive is a box uh, that you can open and uh, there's an instruction sheet there that talks through what each of these items are. Um, we uh, have also uh, prepared uh, a newsletter editorial, something that you can just pop into your community newspaper uh, as well as, a, um, a, again, a copy of the client letter that you can photocopy. And we're really hoping for those uh, that have uh, nursing operations and home care that you will be able to help us out by hand-delivering uh, some of those letters uh, from that kit. So there's, there's instructions uh, on that as well. Uh, so if we can just move uh, quickly to the next, the instruction sheet. So uh, really briefly, this is what the instruction sheet looks like. Uh, you'll receive this in your kit. Um, it includes high-level key messages and instructions on using each of the products. Uh, our goal was to be as clear as possible and take the guesswork of sharing this information uh, and to make it easier for your frontline staff. 
so I, I think with that, maybe if we can just give a preview of the next slide. So here are some examples. Uh, BC Pharmacare has also created a RAT card uh, that includes uh, a welcome to, to the plan. Uh, and again, uh, the signed letter, the news story, um, and the memory stick uh, with the video, uh, which if you've got closed circuit uh, TV, uh, it's, it's good to plug, it, plug and play. Um, so with that, I think we'll just move to the final slide. And a, a couple of uh, questions um, that we can go over now.